India is now the sixth largest economy by nominal GDP and the third largest by purchasing power parity. In 2016-17, the foreign direct investment into the country estimated to have reached an all-time high of USD 60.1 billion. As the economy is soaring, so have the risks to the corporate and services sector. The threats range from cyber security issues to physical security hazards such as the threat of terrorism. In this special episode of India Risk Report, we explore the plethora of these risks with policy and security and how the Indian establishment is responding to them. We also analyze the need for government level intervention, corporate type support mechanisms and inherent strategies within the local ecosystem. Hello and welcome to this episode of India Risk Report where we are going to look at the important issues and threats that could be faced by our industries and the business enterprises in the light of the fact that terrorism continues to target individuals, cities, infrastructure, and most importantly, uh, signs of excellence in countries where the message would go out that the terrorist has an advantage. And we have with us two experts who uh, have looked at terrorism in great detail. Uh, welcome, sir, the Honorable Michael Chertoff, who has been responsible for fortifying the United States after the 9-11 attacks, has been regularly involved in advising governments across the world on security scenarios and responses to it. And we have uh, Mr. Toby Simon of the Synergia Foundation, who, amongst other things, has regular conferences inviting some of the biggest names in the world, like Mr. Chertoff, to Bangalore for issues to be deliberated upon to look at the threats of terrorism, most importantly, how it will affect our lives and uh, the industry. Toby, my first question to you. Uh, terrorism is something that businesses need to pay, to my mind, a lot more interest uh, and heed to. Uh, right now, my fear is, and when I engage with companies, I find much of this has been left to the chief security officer. And whatever he does and whatever assessment he makes goes to the CEO and the MD. And if assurances are given by the chief security officer that all is well, uh, people smile through and go through another week saying all is under control. Uh, but having spoken to a number of chief security officers myself, I find they don't get the kind of support they need. They don't get the kind of resources there is not that kind of an investment in time or money to look at how to make sure businesses will be uh, will have the resilience and not be disrupted uh, do you have some views on that i do maruf uh, in in all security questions the first thing we, we always ask is whether it is a company or an organization what are you trying to protect and the question is then are you putting your resources adequately there to protect it? For example, you might have a large factory with a lot, large number of people, but what is most important could be your manufacturing process. So are you in the, in the larger interest of ensuring longevity or sustainability of the company trying to protect that or just trying to put physical perimeters? Now, the, the challenge for a, 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 a security officer is he normally comes from either a police or an army background, which means his focus is on physical security. On the flip side, if, if the focus of the company is on IT, then they get a CTO, and his focus is basically in the networks. Now, if you really want to address security, there are three triads in the security. You have the physical part, you have the network part, but on top of it, you have the intelligence. And if you are not able to put these things together, you can never have security. Why? Because it doesn't help reacting after something happens because the damage is done. Just imagine there is a threat and some employees die. The morale of the company comes down. So the most important thing here, if you want to be preventive or proactive, is to see that you have good quality of intelligence. And today, you have the ability to pick up over 90% of your intelligence to open source 
be it in the deep web, the dark web, wherever you go, you can find it. Now, the, 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 the sort of dichotomy is we are not able to sync these together because you're bringing people of fundamental, ex functional ex expertise to look at issues. Whereas you need somebody, like when you go become a chief of the army, you would have gone through 50 colleges of, of tactical weapons, intelligence, then you go on top so that you have a, a strategic perspective. So where I feel companies need to invest is on building this strategic capability and not look at the ops. Very good point, very good point. Mr. Chertoff, uh, in the US, do you feel there is enough synergy between the government and the industry in terms of looking at challenges of security? And if there is, what would you give a message to Indians that how do they work out a working relationship where the industry maintains its own autonomy and the government still manages to be uh, the big brother in terms of providing security inputs? I think in the United States, um, the nature of the relationship between business and government on security is uneven. Some businesses have a very good relationship with the government. Those tend to be ad hoc. It may be that a chief security officer came from the FBI, so he's in touch with his old colleagues. Um, some of the um, sectors, economic sectors, are more sophisticated. For example, the financial services sector or the electric utility sector tend to invest a fair amount in cybersecurity, so they are very interactive with the government. Other businesses, frankly, don't really view the government as anything other than we expect the government to defend us. And they don't recognize that in this day and age, whether it's a cyber attack or an attack like we saw in Las Vegas a few weeks ago, the government is not going to be able to be every place at every moment. And so the private sector is going to have to own the responsibility in many cases to protect itself, <clears throat> at least in the first instance. Michael Chertoff mentioned about cyber attacks. Cyber attacks is clearly becoming a bigger and bigger challenge and uh, some people want to address the problem, some people uh, are just turning a blind eye to it. Uh, but quite clearly in the banking sector, uh, there have been some major cyber attacks uh, and they will increase. Also, there is a problem that we in India tend to give away personal information very easily compared to most other countries. And so therefore, how do you prevent I mean, how do you draw a balance between the government pushing again and again that we must go the e-banking route when there have been cases of e-banking huge uh, attacks on the system which has led to, in Bangladesh, in India, and elsewhere in the world, where hundreds of millions of dollars have gone and only been discovered a while later with somebody who was very alert. So, Cyber attacks in the financial sector and your financial well-being, especially for a medium and small enterprise, is a very big challenge. Maruf, uh, why does uh, an adversary, you, know, you, you call him in any, with any name, try to penetrate a system? It's like somebody asked, you know, many years ago, I, I, I read uh, that they asked a, a robber, a big bank robber, why did you rob the bank? Because then he said, that's where the money is. Similarly, why do people focus on banks and financial institutions? They, they, there is nothing personal against them because they know that the time they spend there, they get money. So, and, and there is nothing to feel bad about it. Now the question, the second question you asked, so which means banks have to be extremely uh, uh, cautious about this because they, they will repeatedly do it and in most instances, we will find that banks do not disclose this because they fear that their, their reputation, the share value, whatever, will come down. So most of the time, they just cover it up. Okay? The second question about what you asked me about, you know, how much do we go along the digital way? My, my sense is this. Who can ens ensure us our digital footprint? The government cannot. I mean, the government is not putting, let's say, a firewall to protect me. I am exposed. So who can guarantee me digital security? 
So if you cannot guarantee me my digital security, then my opinion is don't push me on the digital way. I might still like to transact with an old checkbook. I do. You know, me too. No. I, because I, I do as well, actually, yeah. And I mean, Toby makes an important point here, which is we make decisions all the time in our own lives about how much of what we want to do is online, how much data we put online, how often we share information about our email address <coughs> or what we put on social media. You know, there used to be a joke that people would put on their, on their social media, oh, I'm going on, we're going on vacation for two weeks to uh, the beach, and that was like an invitation to the burglars, come rob my house. So uh, I think that um, security begins at home with how you configure your life, not to eliminate risk, because you can't eliminate it, but to reduce your risk. Yeah, and, and I take it further to another point, uh, which is that to what extent do you feel that talking of security beginning at home, uh, do you feel that we in India have really got our priorities right in this era of cyber threats and cyber security and this era of e-money now becoming the way forward because these are issues that uh, are not being explained enough by the government to the citizen. All that I understand is the government is saying, do it, it's good for you. Well, I think this is a problem not, not limited to India. I think it's a universal problem, which is the desire to innovate and come up with new products for consumers is outpacing the security being built into it. So we had an episode of, in the last year where there was a major denial of service attack that was generated from video cameras and baby monitors, the so-called devices on the Internet of Things, because these are not built with any protection in them. There's, they don't patch them. They don't have uh, passwords other than a one, two, three, four password. So they, all of these devices were taken over into a giant network of zombie bots, basically. So I think that we've got to start to, and this is a government responsibility too, require that security be designed at the outset and not merely try to get people to buy new gadgets that turn out to be unprotected. I like to add a little add on to what Michael had said, and it's a great point. The question is always is, who owns my data? I'm actually quite okay that a government owns my data because I believe that they have better bandwidth to protect me. But I'm not okay if a private company owns my data. And let me tell you why. There are companies here which, you know, I'm not taking names on that, where they say, use their, their tool to send money. And then six months later, you realize that a company has been bought over by some foreign company. And today, companies are being sold somewhere in the world by some company. It could be private equity, you know. This change of ownership is something that I, as an individual, cannot be checking every day on the, on the stock market to find out who owns what. Now, this is my single big worry. And how can the government guarantee me that this ownership of the company that I am giving my digital data to will not change? They cannot. So for me, it's, it's a caveat, it's a beware, that you know, we can go so far and no more. Well, some very valuable points that have been brought in by you, and uh, we need to still continue to look at the challenges to homeland security, both through terror attacks and through the new mediums of cyber and other uh, social media networks, which we all as a people have to guard against. But that after a break. Welcome back. We continue to have our two distinguished guests with us and we are continuing to look at the threats of terrorism to business and industry and our society and uh, we are going to also be looking simultaneously to issues related with cyber security, social media messaging and what we as a people can do. Mr. Chertoff, uh, the United States has made 
very, very dramatic moves to enhance his security as also the security of his citizens. Uh, and with that linked is, of course, uh, my concern about future terror attacks is about medium and small scale enterprises because they are often unable to bounce back. The big ones do bounce back. Uh, so what do you feel that uh, could be in terms of this evolving US-India strategic partnership, which are the areas that you feel that you have been able to cooperate successfully with India? And where do you feel there has been a kind of a, a mental wall amongst the Indians that, listen, I mean, this is not what we want you in here for? Well, I think in, in, in general, uh, you know, there's been an uptick in the last uh, several years in, in the uh, amount of cooperation we have with India on defense issues. In particular, there's always the issue of offsets, um, which is India's understandable desire to make sure that they don't simply buy things from overseas, but we actually uh, transfer knowledge and know-how into, into India. And I think that's been quite successful. I mean, to me, my perception has been the major obstacle sometimes has simply been the slowness of budgetary issues or working through the governmental process, not any sense of uh, reluctance out of a matter of policy. And here I think I go back to my time when I was in the cabinet under President Bush. I, I think he really was the first of all of the three recent presidents to really reach out to India and say, we, we have a commonality of interest. And I would go further and say, if you look at the, at the world, uh, the US and India are natural allies. India's in a particularly dangerous area. You've got Pakistan, you've got China, you've got Afghanistan. Um, that implicates American interests. We're both democracies. We both come out of a similar legal tradition. So there's a real opportunity there. Uh, we just need to be a little more efficient sometimes. Tori, last question to you. And that is uh, Prime Minister's demonetization initiative. Uh, was it meant to uh, really reach out and create a completely clean Indian financial environment? Or was it to stifle terror, terror financing? Or was it uh, to address the issue of uh, all sorts of unrecorded transactions? Um, to the extent of terror financing, uh, do you think uh, steps like that are essential from time to time to really uh, stifle the terrors? Um, I don't wish to, 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 to provide any political perspective to this. The, I think it's, it, good, it, it is good in parts, and it is not good, so good in parts. The challenge is when we have to look at its impact on the common man. Now, would demonetization stop terrorist funds? I, I have given a clear example of uh, uh, you know, counterfeiting. As long as you can produce things here and sell, you will get the local currency here. So there are many ways to generate cash locally. If you go to local markets even today, for sure people are, are doing a lot of cash transactions. Having said that, uh, w would it make an impact? Yes. You, you will see that large amounts of cash that was being traded by you know, uh, real estate and all that uh, has almost stopped. And that is good news. Yeah? Now, would this clean the system? It's too early to say. Maybe it'll take time. But the only thing is, in, 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 a, in a society like ours, we just have to be a little bit mindful of the trade-off. Because if the pain points are more, uh, I mean, it's our own people. I mean, how do you make them suffer so much? Yeah, but, but also the, the counter would be amongst those hardline nationalists to say, no pain, no gain. So we have to go through pain to ensure that uh, at least the, the, those who resort to terror financing and activities of that nature, they run into some kind of roadblocks. But we're completely out of time. One la can I make one last point? I say, it's, a, it's a good point that you said about uh, uh, people who might think that this is a good way. But then in a country like India or even the US, as you see now, governments change. Okay? And, and how are we sure that the same will writ will remain? Let us assume the same government comes with another leader. So where is the continuity in what we are trying to build? So you've given a big shock, lots of people have suffered, and then you might have another system. 
uh, which doesn't advocate it. So at the end, we'll say, why, why did we do this all for? Yeah. So my fear is that, that you have to be a little care careful. You should not hasten, like for example, in the US. I mean, you have so many years. Who expected somebody like President, uh, uh, you know, the current president to come? Shaken a lot of things. But I don't believe that this is going to be sustainable. Maybe the next election, you might have the same government, but you might not have the same president. So go back to the point about uh, not of the US president, but you made this good point about uh, when I said that uh, uh, people feel there's no pain, no gain. So but when you say that, you know, where do we draw the line? So. You, do you remember what you were saying? Yeah, I, 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 I remember quite well. I mean, what I said is uh, it, it is nice if, if we are able to draw a, a 10 year, 15 year old plan uh, to, 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 to do but, something. But provided there is consistency, continuity. Yeah, and, and there is no surprise that you do it for five years and somebody else comes in and says, sorry, you know, that didn't work, so I'm going to tell you another painful exercise for another five another. years. The other thing is also that you, you really need to read what's happening around the world. Uh, today you have done this probably when the petrol prices are about 50. And if the petrol prices, oil prices move to 100, you, you, uh, you are in an entirely different terrain. And how do you factor that? You, you just can't predict. So uh, this is why any change that we do must, I feel, be a little more slower calibrated because we have 1.2 billion people here. We are not a small, lots of people tell me, oh, it has happened in Singapore. Singapore is probably the size of Mysore city, you know. Yeah. So this is huge. Right. Uh, Mr. Chertoff, uh, there are multiple challenges that all societies face, uh, particularly in the case of India, because we have all sorts of vulnerabilities. We have borders which are, we try the best to seal them, but there is, somebody can always get through. We have a very large coastline. We have a population within our country uh, where Pakistan in particular reaches out to uh, and does use them to create a certain amount of anti-India tensions. Uh, but I mean that's one set of challenges uh, of homeland security. The second set of challenges for homeland security is everything that is with this new geek era, which is cyber stuff, uh, social media applications, everyone being so hooked on to using their cell phone that all our data is on cell phone. So how would you recommend that India build up just certain pillars of its entire security edifice which would be something within the Ministry of Home looking at each of them slightly in a compartmentalized way but again interacting with each of them. So I would say two things. I would say, <clears throat> first, you have to pursue what we call convergence, which is to recognize that often cybersecurity and data security and physical security are related. And you need to look at both sides or you have a vulnerability. The second thing is that uh, we need to recognize that this is a, an all hands on deck exercise, by which I mean it's not just the federal and the state government. You've got to get local authorities involved. You've got to get communities involved because often they're the ones to first begin to see a threat. You've got to get business involved because businesses can't rely on the government to police every single premises. So this means bringing people into uh, some training, um, information sharing, and creating mechanisms that allow people to reach out immediately if there's an incident. So we're going to, this is a whole of society effort for security in the modern age. It's no longer like it was, you know, back 30 years ago where you said the government defends me and that's all I have to think about. Very true. And in those words which are very, very important that we all have to get involved with our security and just by paying your taxes to the government, you cannot just leave it to the government. But I think it's all hands on deck, as you rightly put it, that have to, everybody has to come out and make their contribution. On that note, thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with us on this show. Uh, illuminating for me and lots of new stuff. And thank you for watching. We'll be back next week with another episode. Until then, goodbye.